the paper is short and very voluminous, and it is about the documentation so uh, more than 60 years ago, Mr. Friedman uh, stated that more than actions the conditions only after the that that it is going to be So this statement remains very brave in the quantitative sense of the story. Um, uh, this is, for example, that the founder of the it is exactly the same to us. We don't have any limits. So, uh, the thing that they do appears to roll out that the monetary policy is that it's a very good way to resolve it. Um, uh, fortunately, the increasing availability of high frequency and high dimensional data creates new opportunities for placing short and long last for the community. Leverage the data of the data which environment in Spain, including the networks, with the couple of non high frequency data from the competition and with the standard high frequency survey application and monetary policy to analyze this. In this sense, this is an empirical paper, this is a historical study of the paper of similar variables which should be published. So, what we do in the paper, we analyze the response of household consumption. Corporate sales and employment real time in EU area for the participants. What we find at aggregate level, the response uh, is separated at a very short times. It is in a way for consumption, within more for sales, stronger, um, with a uh, smoother and long lag response to the final. What could be uh, the meaning of this? It, is, uh, it was already studied by Christian Marinibam and others. It is that the fine aggregation and lower frequency to tie the subjects, leaving only the long last to pay. At the aggregate level, we also benefit from the very rich database to analyze the different results of the international developments. And we see the stronger responses for the papers and respond to what we have. This is not new, and the recently fitted book is a possibility. This was asked in the case of the only data, the only transportation, the system. Housing prices among the trades, the financial market, from confidence in the state of the economy, and also in the car consumption as well. Now, some of the example, how the price of some of the passes is clear to the daily data. So, let's talk a little bit about the data and the methodology, and then we need the result. Uh, the data is part of the uh, private uh, data, like the so the just the target and utilize bank transactions to yeah, two million people. We include all these payments, so this is not only about that bank transactions, and we include card, gas, transfers, and the uh, and the debits, and we also include some estimations from people's banks. Uh, the daily content part of this quarterization can be found in the United States. is high for ratio of the lowest in the low And the data is from April 2015 to December. We also rely on data from the officials, the public health authorities, the Spanish financial authorities, uh, for the aggregate of southward village. Um, especially from the Spanish, Spanish tax authority that compiles series from the daily value of the tax declaration by the uh, It is compulsory for the Spanish with the Spanish campaign, so we do 60,000 large claims accounting for 70% of the domestic sales. Uh, it is important to mention here that finance and first line subsidy includes for the residents, it is. Includes also investment loans for Spanish claims and households, and includes also the sales of the community. The data in this category is also 
the social uh, the Spanish social security has been given to the uh, daily uh, uh, job creation database by making a job destruction the of the day for job creation uh, in the report of the social security is that uh, is also The need of the limit of the monetary policy. So, you are the here, uh, the news of the life of the information. There is an external instrument using high frequency, which can check its high frequency changes in its prices around the ACB to monitor the announcements. We want to do the data. Wow, is that a really good way to do the data? They include there many assets. This information we compute daily in first response functions, may be expected to the surface of the uh, PA, which is the relevant value here, non local projection model in the line of the cost of the For which uh, I will elaborate a little bit about the, the equation with this of the response of the sales consumption and revenue to the plus eight. Which is the time horizon, which is daily in this district, which would also take the shock and the return of the problem with the problem with the superficial of the time. Um, because the, uh, the exercise with the COVID and this would be very distortionary, what we include is two control variables, one in some cases uh, of COVID and similarly for extreme symptoms. The line with the literature will also have last 90 days, last uh, in the end of the year, to the end of the year, to the end of the year. I have to mention that all of the data are in the data base to the business. In the data base, we will also check for the data. So let's talk a little bit about the, the basic result. The first result are on consumption, and what you can see here it is the uh, 660 days uh, window of responses. And on the right, where you can see it was the in the first days. So, what we find for consumption, for aggregate consumption, it is that there is a statistical significant response five days after. Okay. It is a local truth in one quarter for Max, but then also there are more resistant claims of the two justifying the lack On sales, we find probably a similar pattern, but with some lack. In fact, the statistical significance appears at 30 days to 5 days. But the sales also for uh, uh, investment groups and intermediate to other things include better response to this meeting. Last but not least, we can check the response of employment and relative to consumption, it is much smoother and more consistent. This could be you uh, in, the, in the labor market, in Spain, we don't know the opportunities. This is the So, so far, the basic result we have shown is uh, the the responses that monetary policy source of the Smith to the economy us, but we saw the short the short months. It is also true that the three centuries in our study have been global to buy a large align at the end of the system. 
But the electricity data, we have the, uh, the abundance of the angularity. Um, so let me first explain a little bit why this happened. Um, uh, the main reason of why this is happening it is uh, the following. Of course, suppose a researcher probably has access to quantum data, which she find in the impact of monetary policy. So the limits were now. The question was already analyzed by Christian Monique about 87, so this is the limited. And the question is the answer is the temporal aggregation bias can be particularly important in the sense of how we saw this in the paper, we, uh, we can do in this, for example, in this graph, aggregating the responses and also the data in comparison. The integration to module to quarterly, the consumption says and the The only line it is the aggregating the response aggregation. And the last line it is the, the source data aggregating then and then. But you can see that there is no problem to aggregate the model. And most of the, the Valencian bar of the VAR support the policy using uh, the model data also is a solid data. So there is a problem with the model. It is quite simple to solve that. So, uh, the risk that the big data have an advantage is that we can analyze also. How this sort of lags on the board. And we can analyze the daily response of consumption of the cells by product categories, divided by gas, qualities. But we can also analyze the response of the sum of the value of the gas prices from the list. And also the response of the preference. They see what happened for consumption, what we have is the point of categories. And this is important because the alternative I have to do are to see the industries and the value of the So this is very important. And the second reason is I don't think that you can use also the CPM to the efficiency behind the charges. For the sales, we rely on the official data and the daily data are available later. Let's see what happened in consumption. What we see in general is that there are significant sort lags in the labor and civil labor goods, but also in discretionary goods. The basic needs are based on the moment. Here we can see something like this. And you have a uh, sort of lags in those dropping for the transport and swelling in the industry services, education, and then also education, education, restaurant, and things. What happened when we do the same analysis by uh, by sales? Of here, the response is that sectors close to the final demand for the consumption sectors as the extract electronics very clear mass partners. And as the sectors, especially in the sort of light Yes, so the CDC retail first it is that the sector close to the final demand. Here, the extract electronics and of course, in the trade. And you can see that the requirements for the five days and If you move uh, uh, to relatively less companies, sector of the activities that are more business to business, for you to get the action is a little bit later, about fifty days. And if you uh, finally, it is that the response of upstairs, which is like the small response of aggregates in five, you could respond to the so, take away from the implementation of the consumption response to monetary policy. So, this is what we think by the consumption of the labor This is a line specifically. The response of sales is much 
So the different relay responds of say is relative to the sensor, it didn't want to be the response of the absolute sensors. What happened with the uh the variables let's say what happened with the stock market, how she might this she will be reference of the response of the well, the next part of the reference by the council here, the response is almost immediate in the two days after the shock. The reaction of the stock market is also immediate in the two days after the shock. Uh, when they respond to how price could have been used from the uh, data, and it looks that there is a statistical analysis in the response in the third month after the shock, which means that it is the support for it. I'm confident in that, because we're confident in this question. response to the fact that we can do after the shock. The paper has a very detailed uh, appendix, and we could say some of the possibilities of some predictions. Approach uh, of the of the paper. Uh, at this one, for example, we include the, the sample the sample is short and the COVID infected are the sample is as for that what to what it is to repeat the exercise using daily DBA to the index or daily satisfaction with the same number. Or we can rely on some more interesting question to the paper. And the results of the uh, The question of money by source, uh, yeah, especially in the example, so for the answer, uh, we need to repeat the exercise in 2022 and 2023. And also, the robustness to changes in the market, for example, eliminating the silver information in the or the cost of silver, or changing the asset, the value of asset. The, the results in it. Uh, it is a big question on the individual in the that it is a decisionality in this case. We need one of the big questions. Here, what we do, for example, is we shorten the technical test to that at the very case. And we also do that in the individual responses uh, to get the data quickly and to enhance the performance of the year. Last but not least, is this something that happened in Spain because we have uh, different or it happens also the first thing that happens in the news. Uh, it looks that there is a little bit of a difference this thing. I'm going to run on the report as such as, but, uh, uh, but for example, this is So, uh, uh, as a conclusion, monetary policy stocks significantly impact real competitiveness for very for lives. With a way for consumption, we get more for sales, and it's more than a lack of response to monetary. But the effect of monetary policy stocks should be at long and variable lags. The long end would be like the three months. Just a few years for me, with that, in the long run, it's good. They all together move like the same dimension the impact and the which the policy of that is also significant and different. It is time aggregation, which seems to respond to the other class and we have to be careful with that or to change the way we do the model to push the higher risk. And there is some heterogeneity. Sports and consumer assumption to say that the final demand adjustment uh, and PR discretionary and also the and the response, the response by the sales relative to consumption and the real life of the customer. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna and Rolf, for asking me to discuss this very fascinating work. Let me summarize the paper through its most powerful pictures. 
What we see here, let's look at the first panel, is the response of aggregate consumption in the Spanish economy to a monetary policy tightening by the ECB. If we look at this, this looks like something we have seen before. It's an impulse response function with bands and so forth. But this is actually something we have never seen before for the case of consumption, because this is at daily frequency. Consumption is typically only available at lower frequency. And this is the paper through some uh, very involved uh, data construction effort that allows us to look at this daily. So in the second uh, panel, we see the, the zoom in on the first 30 days, which is not possible with the data that we had before. And we see that consumption already responds within a few days to a monetary policy tightening. Does this matter? Is this important? The authors argue yes. And that's what the third panel reveals. In the third panel, as the dashed line, you see the impulse response function of data that is aggregated to quarterly frequency, and then the impulse response function is constructed. And the solid line is the daily impulse response function cumulated to quarterly frequency. And these two things give you a different answer with the daily impulse response function, you do see a significant response at the very beginning. And with the quarterly one, you don't. Before I get to my comments, I want to give some praise uh, to the paper. The paper uses new data to tell us something really new about the world. This is something we did not know. We were not able to look at these types of impulse response functions. And it matters. So we learned something really new. Uh, I like that. The data comes with a lot of challenges. I'll talk more about that. So there's a very involved data construction process that underlies this to just get that data. And there's also some very technically involved decisions that need to be made to construct these impulse response functions. There's some, some challenges peculiar with daily data. I'm going to talk more about that. And the authors do a, a fantastic job here. The paper is also very clearly written. I imagine you can really get lost in the, in the details when you look at that type of data, but the exposition is very clear. It was very easy to follow. I want to make three comments that go from technical issue, technical issues to more a uh, big picture comments. So it goes from sort of nitty gritty to, to punchline. Here's my first comment. Daily data is actually pretty tricky to handle, okay? There's weird seasonalities going on. For example, if we look at the daily uh, impulse response function, the ECB typically meets on Thursdays. Maybe Thursday and Friday consumption is somehow special because we consume different goods and services on Thursdays and Fridays. This needs to be accounted for. Daily data can also have all sorts of other weird noise and, uh, and jumps. Also, that data, uh, the way it is collected and so forth, it's fairly recent in terms of the macroeconomic events that are in the sample. It's only a couple of years. This is all pretty challenging. I uh, was glad to see that the authors um, think carefully about this and explore lots of uh, robustness. But my comment is that I would like the authors to be a little bit more ambitious here in that I, I think it's worthwhile to not only provide robustness, but to sort of establish some best practices. More work with this type of data will be done in the future with better data becoming available. And these decisions are important. Some of those decisions might not be important for this data, for the, for the Spanish case, for Spanish consumption, but they might be important for, I don't know, Italian sales. So it would be nice to, to get some good guidance on what's the best thing to do here. For example, uh, Alvaro said this, the authors use its daily data, but they actually use a 90-day moving average because there's this weird seasonality, this weird noise. That makes sense here, but why is it 90 days? Why not 60? Why not 30? It would be nice to know what's the what should be the best practice, the sort of generally robust practice, not only robust in, in this particular case. 
I also wonder if you make, if you take a moving average, basically you're saying the daily data that we observe sort of has an underlying true daily component that doesn't have the seasonality and the noise. So basically your outcome variable is an estimator. And I wonder whether the bands in the impulse response functions need to be corrected for this. I don't know, they might. I think this is something to think about. Is the smoothing interacting perhaps with some serial correlation that is still present in the shocks? I will talk about that also in my, in my next comment. So these are all sorts of questions that I know the authors are aware of and they do provide robustness, but I would like to see a bit more. I would like to see what are really the, the best choices and, and why. I know this is difficult, but I think this is something the paper can do. And that way the paper can become a reference for, for future work with this type of data. My second comment is about the shock measure that is included in the local projections on the right-hand side. These shock measures have problems. We all have faced these problems when we work with them, but I think some of them might be particularly problematic when we work with daily data. One of them is, is this really a true shock or does it have other effects? It comes from monetary surprises. Are there informational, uh, surprises in here. Everyone has this problem. It might be especially tricky when we when we look at daily frequencies. The authors address this. I think they might try some, some alternatives here. Second issue, there might be serial correlation that is left in that shock measure. And I think that could be particularly problematic if the left-hand side variable is a moving average because the left-hand side variable basically depends on past informations. It depends on a polynomial and the right-hand side variable has serial correlations. So I haven't fully thought it through, but I'm somehow worried that there's an issue here. So I think, and maybe this is already done, but I think the, the surprise could be cleaned by first regressing it on its own legs or legs of the shock and perhaps many legs of the shock should be included, included on the right-hand side uh, of the local projection. I would also appreciate, I, I didn't find this in the paper, I would appreciate a plot of the shock of what actually enters on the right-hand side where the variation comes from. I downloaded this uh, Alta Villa et al. data and show here the one-year uh, interest rate surprise over the sample that is studied in the paper. Some noteworthy things here is that they are almost exclusively tightening shocks in that period. That's fine, but that's something to be aware of. And the second thing is if I compute the serial correlation, there is negative serial correlation in that shock. So perhaps that is worrying and perhaps that justifies those um, additional cleaning steps that I suggested. I also think, and this is a bit of a crazy idea, it would be nice to have an alternative approach to the high frequency identification and the local projection. And I wonder whether the authors can actually set up a daily VAR and do some old school Cholesky ordering, okay? When you, when you put these recursiveness assumptions, they might actually be easier to justify with daily data because then you need to you make a restriction that some variable doesn't respond to another variable within a day and not within a month or within a quarter, okay? So this could be pretty interesting. Set up a standard monetary VAR at daily frequency with sales interest rates, you have that. And then it would be nice to have inflation here, which I know you don't, but there are some, some daily inflation measures for the Euro area that could be added, okay? I think having an, a separate methodology could be uh, could be promising. Okay, and then my third comment, this is about the, the punchline of the paper. Uh, as I said, it's, it's a great, it's a fascinating paper. I do wonder though, when say Powell in that nice quote at the beginning of the presentation, when he talks about long and variable lags, does he really care about the lag at which the responses first become significant? Or does he care about the lag at which most of the response has unfolded. Probably he cares about both, but if he only cares about the latter, 
then this paper wouldn't matter much to him unless we learn more about what's actually going on in, in the economy, okay? So I think the authors can try to do a little bit more on what these very short horizon responses teach us about the mechanisms. What are relevant adjustment costs? In our models, we have all sorts of adjustment costs. Can we learn something about those adjustment costs in the data? Because there might be different types of models with different types of adjustment frictions that generate a lagged response, but have a different micro foundation. And with this data, we could potentially learn about this. This is the, the very last uh, slide. So there are already some cross-sectional breakdowns in the paper by basically by good type and by sector. But I think it might be possible, I don't know, it would be fascinating to have it sort of by household type and firm type, whatever type means that would be guided by what what the, what are the sort of adjustment frictions that that we are interested in and i think given that in in macro models there is increasingly a desire to match macro moments and micro moments and we see here that in terms of the the macro dynamics there's something interesting going on at a very short lag this could sort of help here i know maybe this is for a different paper but sort of one one cool little example might might uh, enhance the punchline of this paper. So I think, yeah, it's a great paper. It's true pioneer work. It's a new kind of data and new uh, uh, results. And yeah, I hope my, my comments are useful for, for improving the paper. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for coming. Um, the question that I'm after in this paper, which is uh, still working in focus is, whether the central bank uh, can occasionally subordinate the goal of price stability to the goal of fiscal sustainability without jeopardizing price stability more generally. And so one reason why I think this question is interesting is that, as we all know, central banks about a year ago, after a long period of low inflation and low interest rates, started to raise interest rates and also communic communicated the intention to keep raising interest rates going forward. And this, in turn, then has led to concerns about fiscal policy, in particular, the sustainability of uh, elevated government debt levels. And so some observers worried that, and here now quoting then uh, Bundesbank President Jens Weidmann, political pressures could arise and grow to keep interest rates lower than the rationale of price stability would call for. And indeed, for instance, the Euro area, in the Euro area, we have seen some governments criticizing the ECB for raising interest rates. And it's actually, so there's an empirical literature which shows that it's actually quite common for uh, governments to criticizing central banks when they're tightening monetary policy. And so in this paper, I'm essentially asking the, the counterfactual, counterfactual question, okay, what would be the implications if central banks would indeed occasionally give into such political pressures for their ability to stabilize inflation more generally? And so I'm addressing this question in a relatively simple uh, uh, macro model with sticky prices, where I consider monetary fiscal policy configuration, where on the one hand, the fiscal authorities' efforts to stabilize government debt only go so far, and I'll be more precise what I mean, what I mean by that in a second, and the central bank accommodates its interest rate policy to the fiscal needs. And so interestingly, earlier this morning, we saw a presentation by uh, Philip Andrade, who showed some survey evidence that indeed in the Euro area, a high share of survey participants uh, kind of expressed the view that uh, fiscal authorities face uh, uh, constraints in, in financing their, uh, their, their budgets and also expressed the view that uh, um, uh, this may uh, also have implications for central banks and this may also put constraints on, on monetary policy. So let me directly jump into the model, which is really very simple and start, let me start here with the um, public sector block. So there's a fiscal authority which issues one period normal bonds, capital BT, and it sets the real primary budget surplus. So here in the baseline model, taxes and uh, transfers are both lump sum. And for the time being, I've uh, log linearized all the model equations except for the monetary and fiscal uh, 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 policy rules. So equation one is the uh, fiscal authority's flow budget constraint, where on the left-hand side, we have the um, real value of government debt at the end of period T, on the right-hand side, we have the uh, real value of uh, government debt at the end of the previous period, the inflation rate between periods T minus one and T, then the real primary surplus, and the uh, cross-normal interest rate 
RT between periods uh, uh, T and T plus one. And so in terms of notation, a hat means that a variable is expressed in percentage deviations from steady state until the means that a variable is expressed as a share of steady state output Y and then in deviation from the steady state ratio. And so the second equation here is the uh, fiscal feedback rule. And as is common in the literature, I assume that the fiscal authority adjusts the primary surplus in response to variations in the real value of government debt. But it's non-standard here is that it does so only up to an upper limit denoted here by this parameter S upper bar, which I'm introducing here in an ad hoc way, but which is uh, kind of supposed to capture this idea that um, for political reasons, the fiscal authority is either unable or unwilling to raise the primary surplus above a certain level. And also for, for, for simplicity, I'm assuming here that this upper limit is, is constant over time and is perfectly known by everyone. And so one way to think about uh, this conf fiscal configuration is then in terms of two policy regimes. One regime that applies when the surplus limit is flat and um, the authority adjusts the primary surplus in response to variations in government debt. That's what I refer to here as the orthodox policy regime and another policy regime that applies when the surplus limit is binding, which I refer to here as the fiscally dominant policy regime. Now, in terms of the central bank, the central bank here sets the short-term normal interest rate. So I'm abstracting here for the uh, moment from any other um, monetary policy instruments. And as long as the surplus limit is slack, that is, as long as the economy is in the orthodox policy regime, the central bank follows a standard Taylor rule and in particular adjusts the nominal interest rate more than one for one to variations in inflation. But when the surplus limit is binding, that is when the economy is in the fiscally dominant regime, then the central bank, worried about the implications of high interest rates for fiscal policy, imposes an upper bound on uh, its interest rate. That is willing to raise the interest rate only up to this upper bound um, denoted by the parameter R upper bar. Okay? And, and just to remind us that even in this simple model, monetary policy or interest rate policy has fiscal effects both directly via the interest rate but also indirectly where its effect on inflation. Um, the private sector block is completely standard uh, textbook New Keynesian model. So equation four is a consumption Euler equation and equation five is non-New Keynesian Phillips curve where mu t here is an uh, exogenous cost push shock that follows a stationary one, uh, you know, one process. And so the idea here is that you know, there, there, there is a shock uh, um, that, uh, leads to an increase in inflation, the central bank responds to uh, the surge in inflation by raising policy rates, and this has then effects for fiscal policy. Yeah, and then um, using a standard definition of a rational expectations equilibrium. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to solve the model analytically, so I uh, have to solve it numerically, and doing so using a global solution method. This means I also have to parameterize the model, but the model is very simple, so I don't want to overemphasize the quantitative results. I think about this more in terms of a conceptual exercise. That said, I think the parameterization of the private sector block is relatively standard. In particular, the subjective discount factor is consistent with an annualized interest rate of uh, a steady state interest rate of 2%. Then I'm assuming that the uh, government debt to annualized output ratio in the deterministic as a steady state equals 100% to capture the idea of an economy that already has an elevated government debt burden. Um, I calibrate the, uh, and, and so this together with the um, subjective discount factor means that the steady state primary surplus equals 2% of output. And then I'm calibrating this um, uh, upper bound uh, or, or upper limit parameter as upper bar such that the uh, uh, surplus limit equals 3% of output. So there's only very limited uh, fiscal space to adjust in response to increases in government debt. With regard to the central bank, um, uh, is that the response coefficient to inflation to 2.5 here in the baseline parameterization and the um, parameter R upper bar to be consistent with a conditional upper bound of 5% um, in annualized terms. So remember in deterministic steady state, it's 2% and then 5% is this conditional upper bound that applies in the fiscally dominant regime. Now, before I get to the main results, let me illustrate uh, to you how this model works, and in particular, how it gives rise to endogenous policy regime shifts. What I'm showing you here is an excerpt from a model simulation where initially the economy is close to the deterministic steady state and in the orthodox policy regime, but then it's hit by a series of inflationary cost push shocks. So inflation goes up, the central bank responds to the increase in inflation by aggressively raising the normal interest rate. And so this leads, um, the, so the real interest rate goes up, 
And this leads to an increase in the real value of government debt to which the fiscal authority initially responds by raising the primary surplus until that is, it hits the uh, uh, um, limit at uh, 3%. And at that point, then the economy has um, shifted to the fiscally dominant regime, which I uh, mark here by the gray shaded area. Now, since the normal interest rate prior to the shift to the fiscally dominant regime is substantially above this conditional upper bound of 5%, the central bank then lowers the policy rate quite uh, aggressively to 5%. Um, but nevertheless, the economy stays in the fiscally dominant regime for a couple of uh, quarters. And in this particular example here, it's only once the economy is hit by a series of disinflationary shocks to which the central bank responds by uh, aggressively cutting the policy rate, the economy then um, shifts back to the uh, orthodox policy regime. Okay, so let me now kind of more systematically analyze how these regime shifts, and in particular, the risk of future regime shifts affects the central bank's abilities to stabilize inflation. What I'm showing you here are equilibrium responses of the key endogenous model variables to the uh, beginning of peer, uh, period level of government debt. So in this, in this simple model, remember there are only two state variables, lack government debt and the cost push shock. And here I'm setting the contemporaneous cost push shock to zero and show how the model variables then vary with the um, uh, with lack government debt or beginning of period government debt. I'm, and I'm doing this for two monetary fiscal configurations. The black solid lines show the equilibrium responses for this configuration uh, that I've just described. And then the red dashed lines show you the equilibrium responses for a benchmark configuration where the fiscal authority always adjusts the primary surplus uh, in response to variations in government debt. And the central bank always, always follows the conventional Taylor rule. So in terms of the... Um, uh, monetary fiscal uh, feedback rules that I've shown you earlier, this would um, correspond to the case where I set this surplus limit to infinity. And so we see that in our, under the monetary fiscal policy configuration with occasional regime shifts, um, if the, uh, if, um, the uh, lack government debt is sufficiently low, then we are in the orthodox policy regime. And then uh, there's a threat, essentially a threshold value for lack government debt such that if uh, government debt is above the thre this threshold value, then we are in the uh, fiscally dominant regime. And so now here I want to focus on the equilibrium response of inflation. And we see that under this configuration with this, uh, um, occasional regime shifts, we see, first of all, the equilibrium response of inflation is uh, strictly positive for all uh, values of lack government debt and for both policy regimes. And secondly, the equilibrium response of inflation is strictly increasing in lack government debt. And this equilibrium response of inflation is very different from what we observe under the benchmark regime, where inflation is invariant to lack government debt and is perfectly stabilized uh, at zero. And so I'll refer to this discrepancy between these two different equilibrium responses of inflation as an inflation bias. And I argue that this inflation bias in the orthodox regime applies, uh, arises due to uh, the fact that the central bank occasionally subordinates the goal of. Uh, price stability to the goal of uh, fiscal sustainability. In order to show this, I'll next show you equilibrium responses to the other state level, namely the cost push shock. And I'm doing this for the case where I uh, fix um, the other state variable, the lag value of government debt at a value that is sufficiently high such that we are in the fiscally dominant regime. Okay? And we see that in the fiscally dominant regime, the response of normal interest rates to cost push shocks is asymmetric. The central bank always lowers the policy rate aggressively in response to disinflation and cost push shocks, but it may not increase or does not increase the normal interest rate in response to sufficiently large uh, inflation and cost push shocks. And this in turn implies then that the real interest rate is actually declining both in response to inflation and disinflation and cost push shocks in the fiscally dominant regime. On the one hand, this indeed helps to stabilize government debt, as you see in the uh, uh, third uh, panel in the first row, where uh, the real value of government debt is falling both in response to inflation and disinflationary shocks. And indeed, if the shock is large enough in absolute magnitude, government debt falls sufficiently such that the economy transitions to the orthodox policy regime in the next period. That happens whenever the equilibrium response of government debt is below this blue horizontal line. But we see that, of course, this also has implications for the equilibrium response of inflation, which also becomes asymmetric. So inflation now increases more in response to an inflationary cost push shock than it declines in response to disinflationary cost push shock of uh, the same magnitude. And this asymmetric inflation response gets baked into in, uh, people's expectations 
So they expect higher inflation in the future, even if they're in the orthodox policy regime today. Now, under standard organizations of the Taylor Rule, the central bank responds to this, uh, these inflationary pressures coming from heightened inflation expectations by raising the policy rate. And indeed, you see that the equilibrium response of the nominal interest rate under the monetary fiscal configuration of interest is higher than what we observe under the benchmark regime. But under standard organizations of the Taylor Rule, the central bank does not fully offset these inflationary pressures. So that in equilibrium, we, we still end up with this inflation bias. So next, I want to uh, 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 look at why this inflation bias is increasing with the debt level. Well, it's increasing with the debt level because the higher the debt level, the higher the probability to shift to the fiscally dominant regime in the future. So in period T, the policy regime in period T plus one is known with certainty, but uh, the policy regimes in periods T plus two and uh, T plus three and so on are uncertain. Uh, and so what I'm plotting here in the first panel is the probability of shifting to the fiscally dominant regime in period T plus one, conditional on information available in period T minus one, and conditional on the economy being in the orthodox policy regime in periods T and T minus one. And I'm showing this here as a function of the cost push shock in period T minus one, and you see that the probability of a shift to the fiscally dominant regime in period T plus one increases with the cost push shock in period T minus one. Why? Because as long as we're in the orthodox policy regime in period T minus one, a higher, uh, the central bank responds to an inflationary cost push shock by raising the policy rate more than one for one, so the real interest rate goes up. This increases uh, the real value of government debt at the end of period T minus one, and therefore brings uh, um, government debt closer, uh, closer to this threshold value uh, denoted here by the horizontal blue line above which the economy is in the fiscally dominant. Okay, so um, one, you, I mean, I said, I don't want to overemphasize the quantitative results here, but one useful summary statistic is to compare the, the, the model's deterministic steady state and the risky steady state, where the risky steady state is the point to which the economy converges when uh, contemporaneous shocks have receded, but agents and forming expectations take into account the risk associated with future shocks. And you see they, here that whereas in the deterministic steady state, inflation is perfectly stabilized. In the risky steady state, uh, inflation is strictly positive. But I, what, what I want to emphasize here in this table is actually that this also has implications for fiscal variables, in particular that um, government debt, the real value of government debt in the risky steady state is also at least slightly higher than in the deterministic steady state. And I argue that this is a direct consequence of the inflation bias. Namely, since um, in the risky steady state economies in the orthodox policy regime, so the central bank responds to the inflation bias by uh, raising the policy rate more than one for one. This leads to a higher real interest rate in the risky steady state than in the deterministic steady state, and equilibrium then leads to this rise in, in government debt. So while on the one hand, monetary policy actually helps to stabilize government debt in the fiscally dominant regime, it also leads to an uh, upward bias in, in the real value of government debt in the, in the orthodox policy regime. Um, now, before, before I stop, let me quickly talk about uh, whether the central bank can um, alleviate the uh, inflation bias. Now, um, might, might, might be tempting to conclude that, well, the central bank should sim uh, simply stick to the conventional Taylor rule, but then of course, uh, this would lead to um, the risk of um, sovereign default unless the fiscal authority uh, uh, kind of then also changes its policy and, and, ra and raises the primary surplus in response to increase in the real value of government debt. But nevertheless, the central bank here in this model can alleviate the um, inflation bias uh, because it can lower the probability of a shift to the fiscally dominant regime. How? By responding sufficiently moderately to inflation while still abiding by the Taylor principle. Okay, and so in this, in this very simple model here, when I lower the response coefficient to inflation from 2.5 to 1.5, the frequency of the fiscal dominant regime is actually close to zero, and hence inflation in the orthodox policy regime is, um, is, is always close to zero. And in this, interestingly, this att attenuation of the inflation bias in this particular example here kind of uh, does not come at the cost of a higher inflation volatility due to the um, uh, kind of less aggressive response to cost uh, cause push shocks because you know this this um, effect that you essentially uh, avoid the fiscally dominant regime um, dominates here. Now in the uh, um, in the paper I'm considering a few extensions. For instance, I'm I mean I've shown you one way how the central bank uh, 
can accommodate um, 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 fiscal policy, namely by imposing this conditional upper bound. Uh, another way that I consider it in the paper is that the central bank shifts to a policy rule that responds less than one for one to inflation when the economy is in the fiscally dominant regime. Um, this also gives rise to, to systematic inflation bias. Consider an extension with distortion to taxation. So that means that then there's another variable, namely the tax base that is influenced by monetary policy. One thing that I still want to do is to introduce long-term government bonds and therefore also allow for re-evaluation effects associated with monetary policy. Monetary policy and um, uh, uh, in, in the same context, also consider um, more persistent shocks and therefore more persistent movements in uh, interest rates. So just to summarize in one sentence, kind of the, the answer to the question uh, at, the, uh, later at the beginning is that, you know, if if the central bank or if um, price stability occasionally takes a backseat, then according to this model, this complicates uh, the central bank's um, uh, uh, task to stabilize price stability also in, in normal times. Um, well, thank you, and I'm very much looking forward to reaching the discussion. Thank you for having me uh, to, uh, to uh, discuss this paper. It's related to my research. So, um, so this paper has a key uh, model feature, which has endogenous shift between different fiscal and monetary policy regime. That's a key um, contribution to the literature. So the um, justification is that if the government is un unwilling or unable to raise fiscal surplus beyond the third level, then the central bank will keep the policy rate be below or upper bound. So that's the fiscal dominance regime. And it goes into that regime triggered by the endogenous variable of the fiscal surplus. So key takeaway is that this occasional subordination of the price stability can lead to uh, systematically higher inflation. So you have inflation and the debt bias in this model. Uh, so this point, can you hide this menu to the bar? Because it's hiding your entire all right, so it's a very interesting and very policy relevant paper. And, uh, um, you know, we have just here that very clear discussion of the paper, so I'm not going to go in details. It's a simple New Keynesian model with endogenous switch. So again, the key feature here is, is endogenous. In the orthodox regime, uh, when the fiscal surplus is below the threshold, then you have the standard Taylor rule. And you also have a standard fiscal rule that the fiscal surplus would adjust to the debt level. So if the debt goes up, then the government will collect higher revenue or cut government spending. And then when the uh, fiscal surplus goes above a certain point, then you switch to a fiscal dominant regime. In this case, uh, the interest rate is a minimum between the Taylor rule or the upper bound. So you are bounded by the a certain threshold. You're gonna below that. And then the fiscal surplus is, is fixed. Uh, there is, this mechanism gives a systematic high inflation and debt. So this is inflation and debt bias. So now before I go through my co uh, comments, I want to connect to the literature. There is a large existing literature on the monetary and fiscal policy interaction, but they all use exogenous region switching. So this paper highlights the endogenous shift between different regions. So that's kind of contribution. Now I have three comments. The first is that there is a hidden region in the paper that is actually conflicting monetary and the fiscal policy region. And the second, I wanted to talk a little bit about the policy trade-off with the fiscal dominance region. What's, is there any benefit with that? And the finally is that since the endogenous region is a key, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the new insight we learned from this paper. So this paper really focus or discusses, emphasize two regime. You start with orthodox regime, and then mm -hmm. you, when uh, the fiscal surplus goes above or beyond a certain threshold, you go to fiscal dominant regime. But implicitly, they can have three regions. So which is you start with orthodox regime, and then when the fiscal surplus goes above the certain th threshold as far, but then the interest rate is not high enough then your interest rate is still uh, follow the tail. So in this case is the fiscal policy is active and you also have a monetary policy is active. So that's a conflict region. And then it goes to fiscal regime. If uh, it continues, the interest rate continues to increase. 
So in the conflict region is that the fiscal policy are unable and willing to raise for surplus and the monetary policy also stick to the tailor. So why that is important? So this chart shows that, so um, the shaded area is, is uh, when, the, uh, when the debt is, goes above or beyond a certain point and the primary surplus go above the threshold. You can see from the nominal interest rate is not flat. So if it's, you are in a fiscal dominance regime, the interest rate would be kept at uh, the upper uh, bound, but here it's keep increasing. So this is saying that the fiscal surplus is not responding, but the nominal interest keep increasing. So I think you know, this paper contributes the inflation and the debt bias to the presence of fiscally dominant regime. That certainly is a case, but I wonder quantitatively, you know, the conflict regime could be could be more important depending on the calibration. So in Bianca and Melosi's paper, they have exogenous monetary and fiscal policy regime, and they're highlighting that when you have a conflict regime, that is could be uh, lead to more vicious cycle than the fiscal dominant regime. So this is from that paper. Um, the the study with dark shaded area is you get uh, a negative shock. And therefore, then the, it goes to the light shaded area that is depends on the regime and then it comes up. So the uh, dashed line is showing you coming from, um, you give a, get a shock and then the agent knows you're going to go to the fiscal policy regime. Well, the solid line here is showing that uh, in the light shaded area, there could be conflict. So you're going through the conflict region and then go to fiscal region. So what it shows here is that if you know you're gonna just go to fiscal region directly, you get output uh, gap actually goes up and then inflation does go up, but not to that extent. But on the other hand, if you have a solid, like you are not sure you're gonna have a conflict region, then the output is gonna be much lower. So their takeaway is that the conflict region could be very important. And, I, um, and that seems to be present in this paper as well. Okay, so my second comment is that on the trade-off of this fiscal dominant region, this paper highlights a cost, is that it leads to a high inflation and debt at the steady state, which uh, we can see from the risky steady state here. But they also benefit, um, from this chart, right? Uh, the solid line here showing that when you are in the fiscal regime, when you get a uh, cost per shock, uh, shock, the output could be significantly higher than the baseline case. The baseline case is you just have the standard uh, monetary regime. Um, and the inflation is higher, but it's not significantly higher. So it seems to be, there could be some benefit of having the fiscal regime uh, based on the model. So I think the question is how to evaluate the trade-offs and do the trade-off depends on shock. And uh, um, you know, again, Bianchi and Melosi, their paper, they focus on demand shock. They find is that if you have a commitment to inflate away some debt in a large recession, that is welfare improving. But of course, you, know, you have a cost push up, uh, that could change the, the result. And finally, um, is since your paper is really focused on the endogenous region switching, um, at the moment you highlight the inflation debt bias, but this bias also present in the model with exogenous region switching. Uh, so for instance, this paper, it shows that you have a tax shock, which is kind of related to cost push shock, and then impact on the inflation. The dashed horizontal line is showing you just have a monetary cost region. So the, it has no impact on the inflation. And then the uh, kind of 45 degree line that shows is that it's a fiscal regime. And here it shows that it has impact on the inflation. And that depends on your region switching probability, you can somewhat in the middle. So this bias present in the exogenous region. So um, I think your contribution is really on the endogenous region. And for instance, what you just said, you know, I find your find here is very intriguing is you say, central bank, in order to uh, lower inflation, they should be react less aggressively so that they will not go to the fiscal region. And this is coming, the insight coming from the endogenous region switching mechanism here. So I think I would um, suggest to emphasize this new insight really highlights you know, what we gain from the endogenous region switching uh, compared to existing region. Thank you.
So that's all I have. I think it's a very interesting paper, but uh, I think maybe focus more on the you know, new insight. All right, thanks so much. Uh, this paper is actually very closely related to the previous one. So uh, hopefully that will make it easier. I know this is the last paper of the day, a long day of many of you are jet lagged. And then this is unfortunately a very complicated paper, uh, but I'll do the best I can, okay? Um, so the motivation is the same. We just went through this period of largely rapidly increasing government debt. A lot of that was sort of financed through deficits. You know, monetary policy was accommodative, uh, sort of both uh, at the, the, the short end, interest rates went down at the long end. And then also we had this period of, of unconventional, like quite extreme unconventional monetary policy, first sort of in response to the GFC and then later in response to COVID. So much so that essentially all of the long-term debt issued was bought by the Fed in the United States, okay? So sort of what I think we miss is sort of a, a a framework for thinking about sort of both conventional and unconventional monetary policy uh, in, an, in an equilibrium model uh, that also can think about this fiscal and monetary policy interaction that the last paper also spoke about. So we were sort of interested in understanding uh, this, this simple question of can monetary policy reduce the fiscal burden? Um, and, and in particular, our focus is going to be can unconventional monetary policy reduce the fiscal burden, uh, you know, sort of as opposed to the previous paper, which was more on conventional monetary policy. We actually do an, an exercise which is very similar to the paper you just saw at the end of our paper on, on conventional monetary policy, but I doubt I will have time to talk about that. So why could, uh, I think the answer to that question is clearly yes, it's a quantitative question. How could monetary policy affect the fiscal burden? Well. Uh, by lowering short-term interest rates, potentially by lowering long-term interest rates through unconventional monetary policy, um, potentially by condoning higher inflation, as we were just discussing, uh, and potentially, uh, you know, unconventional mon monetary policy changes the share of long-term debt in the hands of the private sector. So, you know, if interest rates are lower on short, at, the, at the short end than at the long end, then that too will reduce the debt burden for the government. So all of these are very standard, very simple ways. I mean, there's sort of a, a question of, can you get these things going in a general equilibrium model? Um, what's more interesting maybe is that there's also all sorts of interesting GE effects, right? If unconventional monetary policy can stimulate the economy, then uh, there's potentially sort of an additional channel uh, through which um, monetary policy could, could reduce the fiscal burden, okay? So what are we gonna find? So what we're gonna do in this paper is set up, I think, um, a new, um, new Keynesian model that's, uh, I think, different from the standard model in the sense that it has an intermediary sector, which is quite important. Uh, it has sort of much risker, richer fiscal uh, uh, policy. In fact, we also have endogenously uh, regime switches, uh, which I'll talk about. Um, and then we're going to use this model to, as a laboratory to think about a crisis. And in the crisis, there's going to be both negative aggregate supply shocks. Think of it as cost push shocks. We're going to have productivity shocks, but probably doesn't make a difference. And negative demand shocks that are going to push the economy into the ZLB. Okay. And then we're going to sort of ask, can the policy mix of unconventional uh, and fiscal policy sort of get us out of this, uh, out of this hole? And, and, and sort of, if so, what is the contribution of unconventional monetary policy for doing this, okay? And so we're gonna evaluate a policy mix that has sort of a combination of additional government spending, transfer spending, so think of it as unemployment benefits, uh, as well as unconventional monetary policy that's la that lasts beyond the end of the actual uh, negative shocks. And we're going to show that that policy mix is actually highly effective. So the counterfactual where you, you didn't have, where you had sort of traditional monetary and fiscal policy would leave us in a much deeper recession than the one we actually observed. Okay. And, and we're also going to find that, you know, the answer to our question in the title is yes, unconventional monetary policy, this policy mix ends up reducing the debt to GDP ratio by about 5.3 percentage points relative to the counterfactual, what we would have had if we hadn't had that policy mix. So yes, we can cut the debt to GDP ratio through this policy mix. Uh, there's also an interesting effect on the risk of future tax increases, not just sort of the mean level of debt, but the probability that we get into a real fiscal crisis is also cut by doing unconventional monetary policy. And we'll talk about that. And then this, the last part of the paper is very closely related to the previous paper which is sort of a conventional monetary policy where we sort of imagine, you know, Joe Biden spending 
an additional doing an additional tax bill, spending additional transfer money, and then that sort of triggers inflation. And what if the the Fed accommodates this additional transfer spending by sort of changing by by sort of uh, you know being more accommodative uh, in the Taylor rule? And as long as people don't understand that that's what the Fed is doing, this could this actually you know uh, ends up reducing the the value of debt. But if people have rational expectations, and this is act and and sort of this. Think of a Taylor rule with an additional debt to GDP piece in it. If people understand that that's actually the new Taylor rule, then this policy doesn't work. It's counterfactual. It's it's counterproductive actually. Okay, so but I probably don't have much time on that last part. So here's sort of the model in one graph. And like I said, it's sort of a complicated model. There's four sectors in the economy. There is a household sector. The households they buy long-term government debt. They are also the shareholders of both the banks, the intermediaries, and the firms, the producers. Um, they're also, um, and so the way they, they, they save, in addition to equity, is they also invest uh, either in bank deposits or in capital that they directly lend to the firms. Okay, but then firms are also getting credit through the banking sector. Okay, and then the banks are also holding short-term debt and reserves, which are the same asset in this economy. Okay, so this model has two uh, maturities of government debt, short-term and long-term, okay? Um, and then, so in terms of the shocks, the model has both uh, standard macro shocks, uh, TFP shocks, as well as uh, productivity growth shocks, which are standard in finance, okay? And it's important to have both of, the, both of these shocks, both sort of transitory and permanent shocks. Um, our household has recursive preferences, a quantitative model, uh, receives utility from consumption, also direct utility from deposits. Deposits provide sort of uh, liquidity services, and they uh, don't like it to work. Um, there's two frictions in that. So the household sort of solves this portfolio problem that I illustrated on the previous slide, right? They have to sort of make a portfolio choice between all these different assets. But there's two frictions in that portfolio choice. One is uh, households are not very good at, at directly lending to firms, right? So if, when, when households directly lend to firms, you know, they're not as good at it as the intermediaries are. That's why we have banks. Think of that as sort of traditional monitoring and screening uh, services that banks can provide. Um, that's the first friction. Um, and then the second friction is that when households hold long-term bonds, they face a holding cost for holding these bonds. This is going to be necessary for the model to generate an upward sloping term structure on average, which is important for thinking about unconventional monetary policy. Um, so sort of, and then it's also going to be important for thinking about what unconventional monetary policy does by removing long-term government bonds from the household's balance sheet. The household is sort of walking down its downward sloping demand curve, walking up its downward sloping demand curve, I should say. And, the, and that's going to, through this holding cost, have impact on the term spread. Okay, but we're going to match the um, this, uh, elasticity of, of bond yields to changes in, in, in government bond supply to the data to discipline this, this cost. And then our intermediary, um, as, we, as we saw, they can issue equity. Uh, whenever they go back to the household sector to raise new equity, they incur a cost. And then they have these two regulatory bank capital requirements. Uh, one is sort of a fairly standard regulatory capital requirement that limits the leverage ratio of the banks. Uh, there's sort of two, two uh, parameters here. One is an overall um, a parameter on total, on total assets. So think of this as a supplementary leverage ratio constraint. And then there's an extra on the risky capital on the loans that banks make to firms. Uh, they think of this as sort of a Basel risk weight. Okay, so both of these uh, are at play and we have a, an LCR type cost that banks face as well. So what about monetary policy? Monetary policy here has two, the monetary policy authority has two tools. One is a standard Taylor rule, interest on reserves. Uh, the second one is QE. So the banks, the, 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 the monetary authority can basically decide to do uh, buy long-term government debt from the households and issue short-term reserves to the banking sector. That's interesting because that affects the maturity composition of the debt that's actually held by the public. It also affects the allocation of assets across intermediaries and households. So this is sort of, no, there's this monetary non-neutrality in two ways here, in the standard New Keynesian way, as well as in this particular way through QE. Um, fiscal policy is more interesting, and that's sort of related to uh, the previous paper. So as I said, the government issues both long-term and short-term debts. We assume that they issue those in fixed proportions. And then 
fiscal policy is a sort of standard act of fiscal policy in the sense that there's it's counter cyclical government spending both transfer spending and um, discretionary spending are counter cyclical. And taxes, taxes are interesting. So taxes, we also have two regimes here, and these regimes are also endogenous. In regime one, um, actually, the tax policy is also active in the sense that tax rev tax revenues are pro-cyclical. Okay, so you know, in bad times, the government reduces tax revenues in order to stimulate to stabilize the economy. So both in regime one, both monetary and fiscal policy are active, and there's no problem. But that, that party cannot last forever because at some point something has to control the debt. So that sort of endogenously when you just to the facet to the passive fiscal policy regime, when the debt to GDP ratio gets high enough, because at some point you've got to control the debt. So this is sort of what it looks like. The blue line is the is the is the ergodic distribution of the debt to GDP ratio. So you basically get this point here, this dashed line. And once the debt to GDP ratio crosses into this region to the right of the dashed line, we call this the austerity region. That's when the fiscal policy endogenously switches from active to passive. So now fiscal policy has to start controlling the debt. So basically what now need, now taxes need to go up in order to bring the economy back below this regime. Okay, so you can see the tax rate here relative to the steady state tax rate is kind of sort of going up. Now, how do we pin down this, this line? This is sort of your question of as bar in your paper. Here, basically, this line gets pinned down endogenously in order to keep the debt safe. What I mean by that is if you move this line just an epsilon to the right, there would be some paths, some stochastic shocks that would hit the economy that would no longer allow you to go back to the interior. In other words, the debt would no longer be safe at probability one. What's happening here is there's Laffer curve effects. There's distortionary labor income taxation. And as debt to GDP comes too high, you need to raise the taxes too much. People stop working. And so there's no longer a tax rate that will allow you to get back into the interior. Okay, so that's what pins down. Basically all the parameters, this is a very complicated object, this, this boundary. It sort of depends on all the parameters of the model, but you know, for example, the labor supply elasticity is a key one based on that Laffer curve intuition. Okay, and there's also what we call a profligacy region here, a region here on the left, where you need to do the opposite. You need to lower taxes. In between, fiscal policy and monetary policy can both be active. Okay, and this model generates very persistent. So you could easily have paths of 75 years where the economy is sitting in the interior of this region. So when we look at reality from the perspective of the model, we've been sort of hovering in this area here for 75 years, this line is something like 115% of GDP. If and when we cross that line, which according to the CBO, we will in the near term, uh, you know, that's when the party is over and taxes will have to go. So, you know, um, okay, this is just standard uh, equilibrium. So what do we, so this, we solve this model globally nonlinear. It's a very complicated model. It has five continuous state variables. Actually, four. We can eliminate one, so it's three continuous state variables, and then two persist two this two productivity um, processes, which are, which are also persistent. Uh, and there's three nonlinearities in this model. One is occasionally binding intermediary constraints. Remember, our intermediaries have this leverage constraint, the ZLB, and then this global tax rule that we were just talking about. All of the, all three are nonlinearity. So we're going to solve this model globally, nonlinearly. We're also going to argue that. We really, it's important to have large risk and large risk premium. And it turns out that, you know, when we started studying the New Keynesian literature, um, the New Keynesian literature doesn't have any models with large risk and large risk premium. Uh, and so we had to spend a lot of time trying to find a setting that could actually generate a lot of risk. Um, that's going to turn out to be very important because if we lower risk and risk aversion, all the results change quite dramatically. Um, so we think this is sort of a separate contribution in its own right. It also complicates matters though, because now the stochastic steady state is far away from the deterministic steady state. There's an additional fixed point problem you got to solve just to calibrate the model. Um, I don't have much time, but sort of we match volatility of output growth, pro productivity growth. Uh, we actually generate a reasonable error thread coefficient of relative risk aversion of five. 
uh, IES of four. Uh, we match the real rate. We match consumption growth. We fit a bunch of features about government, about the government. 76% uh, of debt, government debt is long-term. The average duration of long-term debt matches the data. And then we have all the, we match the cyclicality of spending, transfer, and tax revenues to the data. Okay. Uh, we also match the liquidity cost, the spread between the Fed funds rate and the deposit rate, as well as the, the term spread, uh, the slope of the yield curve, which is, again, not easy to do. Most of most models in the New Keynesian tradition do not generate any, any slope of the yield curve. Um, okay, there's sort of a lot more detail in the paper, which I'm going to skip in the interest of time. So the main exercise we do is we let this economy undergo a bad crisis, which is a negative TFP shock, as well as a negative aggregate demand shock. This shock, these shocks are going to push the economy into the ZLB. Okay, we're going to assume that the shock lasts for four quarters, sort of dissipates with probability five afterwards. Um, and uh, again, we impose the ZLB because the, the shadow rate is really negative point. We're going, to comp we're going to compare a series of policy uh, responses to this crisis. One is what we call automatic stabilizers, which means traditional monetary policy and traditional fiscal policy. The second one is we're going to add on top of that monetary policy where the central bank buys about a quarter of all outstanding long-term treasury debt that are held by the households and issues reserves. Uh, this is roughly the magnitude of the QE1 that we saw in the, in the GFC. We're also going to simultaneously relax the supplementary leverage ratio for reserves, which is what the Fed did for about a year uh, during COVID. We're also going to consider a policy that has additional transfer spending. Uh, again, sort of, uh, sort of of the of the magnitude that what we saw uh, in during COVID, uh, and we're going to come back to a version where uh, we do a UMP for longer, right? So instead of just scaling UMP back as soon as the crisis is over, we let UMP last longer. And so we're going to argue that this last policy mix is the data generating process. That's sort of what we saw in the real world. That's how the shocks under this policy, we generate the right amount of inflation is what we saw in the GFC. And we sort of see the, we have also the right amount of, uh, the right amount of spend. So the green line is the data generating process. The blue line is the counterfactual where we, if we, where we don't do UMP for longer and we don't do the additional transfer spending. Okay, so what do we see? We see that sort of, this is a bad set of shocks. It sort of de triggers a deep recession where GDP falls two and a half percent relative to trend. But it would have been much, much worse. It would have been six and a half, seven percent decline in output if we hadn't done the additional UMP and the additional transfer spending. Okay, consumption would have fallen six percent. Investment would have fallen twelve percent. This would have been in a deep, deep crisis. Some of this effect comes from the additional transfer spending. So about so the two thirds of the boost in output comes from the transfer spending. The other one third comes from UMP. So UMP here does have GE effects. It does stimulate the economy. Um, and then sort of keeping UMP on for longer, it's sort of the difference between the purple and the green line that has a little bit of additional uh, uh, sp uh, stimulative effects. Okay. So what about our question of does monetary policy create fiscal capacity? Well, the answer is sort of in the right panel here, right? So here is what happens to the debt to GDP ratio along this transition path. And again, sort of the green line is the data generating process, right? So basically, we're spending a, a bunch of additional money. It's also just a bad recession. So all sorts of fiscal, traditional fiscal policy responses kick in. Uh, the deficit is deeply negative, and the debt to GDP ratio goes up. Now, if we had just done the additional spending and not the unconventional monetary policy, we would have been at the red line. So relative to the red line, um, we're, by doing unconventional monetary policy, we're reducing the debt to GDP ratio by about, uh, by about uh, 5 percent, five percentage points. Okay, so that's the extent to which UMP can low can create fiscal capacity. It generates about five percentage points lower debt to GDP through a combination of the short rate goes down to the zero lower bound. The long rate goes down by about 50 basis points. A lot of this is coming again from UMP. So UMP in equilibrium can generate lower interest rates. Uh, we know that's true in the data empirically. It's true in this GE model as well. And it's coming through the substitution of essentially removing long-term debt uh, from the household's balance sheet and issuing further debt 
So all of these forces combined, in addition to the GE effect on, on output, end up generating some additional fiscal capacity. Okay, so that's sort of the main the main result of the paper. They also end up lowering the debt service uh, naturally. So what's the economics of what's going on here? Why does QE work? Why does UMP work in this model? Well, essentially, UMP acts like a positive aggregate demand shock. And remember, I hit the economy with a negative aggregate demand shock. So if you could sort of create a positive aggregate demand shock, it sort of undoes the effect of a negative aggregate demand shock, very simplistically put. So why does QE have this effect? So what happens is when the central bank buys this long-term debt from the households and turns it into bank reserves, reserves are better collateral for banks than firm capital because of, uh, because of the Basel risk weights. And so what banks do is basically they say, you know, we have all these wonderful reserve assets. We don't want to make as many loans to these banks, to these firms anymore. And so banks basically shed capital. So this is a crowding out channel of quantitative easing. Now, what that means is that the households in our, if banks do less intermediation, households have to step in and do more of the intermediation, but they're not as good at it as the banks. And so this end, they end up essentially saving less, um, earning lower returns on wealth, and consuming more. And so basically, through this crowding out effect, consumption gets boosted, and, um, and that sort of then sets off as, as a traditional new Keynesian substitution effect where, you know, there's more more demand, there's firms hire more, they invest more, prices go up, wages go up, and so forth. And that sort of creates this, this stimulative effect from QE. Now, it turns out QE does not work if you do it in normal time. So if you just do the same amount of QE, but not in response to a negative aggregate demand shock, it has qualitatively all the same effects, but they're literally an order of magnitude small. It's also crucial that QE gets reversed. So QE gets followed by QT. If you don't follow QE by Q3, you make it permanent, then instead of acting like a temporary aggregate positive demand shock, it acts like a negative permanent supply shock, okay? Which, um, which ends up sort of not uh, being very counterproductive. There's all sorts of interesting state dependencies on just how much debt to GDP the economy starts from. Uh, QE is much more effective when you start from a low amount of debt to GDP. Uh, let me just leave it at that in the interest of time. The last picture I want to show you, I think, is a pretty nice picture. It shows you uh, the likelihood of ending up in this austerity region where we have to slam the brakes and increase taxes. So imagine the economy starts at a high level of debt, 85% debt to GDP, and, and now uh, basically gets hit with this crisis, debt to GDP goes up. This is sort of the same path I showed you before. But now I'm showing you a lot of different paths because the shock, there are shocks in this economy, and so a lot of different things could happen. Along some of these paths, we end up in austerity. If we just had the automatic stabilization policy, we would end up in austerity with 28% probability. If we do UMP, we can cut that probability to 19%. So that's the sense in which we're not only lowering the mean path of the debt to GDP ratio, that's sort of my additional fiscal capacity, there's also a fiscal risk avoidance channel of monetary policy at work here where we lower the risk of ending up in the austerity region, region where we have to increase taxes. Okay. So this is this additional conventional monetary policy exercise I uh, discussed. A really interesting paper that is not only introduces a, a new mechanism to me regarding classic purchasing, but also puts it into a, a fully fledged macro finance model and is personally quite a humbling experience just trying to figure out how this model is solved in the first place. But I'll mention that briefly later. But for before I go towards my comments, let me briefly go through the intuition behind the transmission channel of asset purchases, which to me is in some sense quite new. And I'd like to just get the intuition of this before I go to my comments. So in this paper, what is a QE shock or unconventional monetary policy? It is where the central bank sells short-term bonds, in other words, central bank reserves, which are held exclusively by banks here or intermediaries, and uses, those, uses the funds raised to buy long-term bonds, which are held exclusively by households here. So the QE interacts directly with two types of entities in this model here. Firstly is the banking sector. So put simply, and at the risk of overly abstracting from this model, so the balance sheet looks simply where they make a portfolio choice, where banks invest in capital, firm capital, as well as short-term bonds. And that can be financed in two ways, either through the issuance of deposits or through the issuance of equity. Now, ideally, banks would like to fund themselves entirely with deposits, because it's a cheap source of funding due to the convenience that's attached to this liability. 
But uh, due to leverage constraint, they need to finance some of these assets with equity. And also they're subject to a liquidity cost. And the reason why they hold these long-term bonds is they're used to manage the short-term liquidity withdrawals that you'd face from deposits. So how does QE interact with this bank? Well, you can see mechanically, it's enforcing in endogenously in equilibrium that they hold more short-term bonds or they hold more reserves. So how do they finance this? Well, they could just finance it by issuing deposits one for one, but of course, by the leverage constraint, they cannot do this. So they need to partly fund it with equity. But equity issuance is costly from the perspective of the bank. So they finance in equilibrium these issuance of bonds partly by, by investing less in capital, in other words, crowding out capital. So from this perspective, asset purchase is seen to actually not be stimulative, if anything, the opposite. But what's crucial is the way in which it interacts with the household sector. So the household sector here is simply investing in a portfolio of assets, of capital deposits, as well as these long-term bonds. So how does QE interact with this sector? Well, QE is essentially reducing the supply of these long-term bonds. So in order to induce households to hold less of these bonds, the expected return on this asset needs to fall. And so endogenously as a consequence of this, they rebalance the capital and that counteracts the crowding out channel that's happening on the banking sector side. So, and the crucial thing here is that the returns on the assets are falling. The return on long-term bonds are falling because that induces house to rebalance. And because they're rebalancing into capital, the expected return on capital also falls. So that's the key intuition because here this, this rebalancing is done a lot of the literature with regard to asset purchases in order to understand the portfolio rebalancing effect and the consequent effect on asset prices. But the really nice thing about this paper, among many other aspects, is the way in which this can map to the real economy. And the key thing here is the reduction in the expected return on assets. And it's for two reasons. Firstly, it's because it reduces the lower, it reduces the return on savings for households. And so you have the standard intertemporal elasticity of substitution within the New Keynesian model. But crucially, it also lowers the interest payments on debt for the government. And why does that matter is because it lowers the path of the debt to GDP ratio. And by lowering this path, it's going to lower the austerity risk. In other words, lower the risk that exceeds the threshold where fiscal policy has to become, uh, has to be in the form of austerity. This as a result reduces tail risk, the risk premium falls, and as a result, you have more capital investment. So you can see that, so this is the key channel. Now, why does this matter for in terms of fiscal capacity? Because after QE, by reducing the risk of austerity, you increase the, the ability for the government to actually engage in, um, in fiscal transfers, which is what additionally bolsters the sort of the, the counterbalancing to this very negative demand shock. So this is why monetary policy can create fiscal capacity. And I would just like it before I make my comments. Is it okay? Oh, to get rid of this. It's okay. It's okay. Um, and one before I before I turn to my comments, one thing I will say is 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 one word of praise is how this model is solved given the large extent of nonlinearities in this model that's already been described. So, firstly, we have the ZLB, we have the state contingent tax policy, and also we have very realistic levels of risk premia, which of course are very difficult to, to obtain uh, as, as those who work with these models. And so by having these Epstein's in preferences, which are notoriously quite difficult to solve with. So it's a word of praise as to how this model is actually solved very effectively. So the three, I have three comments. So the first comment is in relation to how, how QE is actually defined in this framework. So it's defined by they buy long-term bonds exclusively against households, and they sell short-term bonds, in other words, reserves only to banks. And so we have this crowding out effect that I mentioned to you earlier. But often in most of the other, a lot of the other literature that describes QE, this QE also buys assets that are held by banks. For example, they buy firm capital in the gertler karadi type models as a way to understand the quantitative effects of QE. Or they buy mortgage-backed securities that are originated by banks. So here, the mechanism is that you release risk capacity for banks that they can allocate to new firm loans or to new household mortgages. And so we have, this is why we have a stimulative effect. But here we don't have that in this framework. We instead have it endogenously through the household rebalances their portfolio. And the justification they make is that intermediaries hold a small share of the long-term bond stock. In other words, they only hold 5.9% of the stock. 
So why does this matter? It matters because if the central bank buys long-term bonds, they're mainly buying them and purchasing, purchasing them against non-intermediaries. Non but what I would like to see is what are the demand elasticities of intermediaries with respect to these long-term bonds? Even if the stock is low, it could still matter if their demand is highly elastic, in which case they're interacting less with the household sector, and so you have less of these GE effects. The second justification is that this, there's evidence of this crowding out effect channel in the paper that they, they, they mention. Um, but just to note that this experiment is increasing the supply of reserves, holding all else constant. In other words, holding constant what they actually purchase. So is this definition of QE the full story? Perhaps it is for long-term government bonds, but maybe less so for the other types of assets that they purchase. But that's just one thing to keep in mind. Now, the second comment I have is, is more exploratory if, if it's possible to add any more dimensions to this uh, pre-involved model is, at the risk of abstraction, the interest rate on central bank reserves is roughly equal to the short-term rate on the house, in the household Euler equation, minus the convenience yield that holders of reserves attach to these central bank reserves. And why do banks value them for as collateral? Because they're used to back deposits, which are a cheap source of funding. So and why does this matter? Because if the convenience yield is in operation and increases, it makes the zero lower bound more likely on the, on the policy rate. And this is why it matters. So one extension I was thinking of, which is particularly related to the US, is that there's quite a large, of course, time very large and time varying demand, foreign demand for US collateral assets, in other words, like US treasuries. And so you can imagine that like such a large demand shock in the US is also somewhat consistent with the large global demand shock. And you'd imagine that a contractionary shock in the US also is probably consistent with the state of the world in which foreign demand for US collateral assets also increases a lot and induces an increase in the convenience yield, which makes the zero lower bound even more binding in these kinds of states. And if anything, this is why our QE could actually be more effective if there's a way to introduce foreign demand for these collateral assets, because QE in, in, in general equilibrium by stimulating the demand within the US could also dampen this demand for collateral from the foreign sector. Um, and also a second extension, which is related to uh, what was presented this morning and also some new paper by, work by Vera Lecharia and others, which is that asset purchases is induces a large increase in the supply of short-term bonds or central bank reserves. Now this in induces a big liquidity benefit because it's by issuing, increasing the issuance of deposits that are backed by reserves, it induces a welfare benefit to households. But one thing I was, I was wondering when reading this paper is that there's a lot of in increasing empirical documentation that deposits rise with QE, but they don't fall with QT. So is there some way in which the required collateral kind of crowds out the capital through, during the tightening of asset purchases. In other words, if deposits are sticky downwards, is that crowding out the investment that banks can make in capital? And then the final, the small final comment is, uh, I think you described to me this area. So it's, 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 this is, as he it was described earlier, is that this blue uh, shaded area is the ergodic distribution of debt GDP ratios within this model. Now you notice here that this austerity region over a very long horizon means austerity occurs around 30% of the time. And one thing, a question I was wondering is what, I know that the autocorrelation of debt GDP is very large, but I would just like to know the, the, the answer of like, what's the probability of observing actually 75 years without austerity over say a 2000 year period? And if this is fairly high, then of course, then there's no problem whatsoever. But if, if it is highly unlikely is in some ways, does it overplay this, the change in the likelihoods of austerity? And this is more just because one thing that was striking is actually the sheer size of the effect of QE in this model. It almost has like one to 2% effect on output. And I think the bar for how much you need to get asset purchases to work in relation to literature is very low. So it's usually papers have 20 to 25 basis points of an effect here. So the effect that, that you have on this paper is absolute, is really large and effective. Um, and so that was just one small uh, question I had regarding this distribution. And uh, I have some other comments, but I'll, I'll defer that to later time. So thank you. Thank you, Jared. These are fantastic comments. Um,
So as you said, sort of the, the model makes a pretty stark assumption on who holds long-term bonds uh, and who holds short-term bonds. You know, we justified it sort of based on empirical data, as, as you noticed. But I agree with you. What really